Good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Donnelly. I'm director of the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics in Oxford, and I'm joint chair of the steering committee of the Centre for Personalised Medicine. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here to tonight's lecture, which forms the formal launch event for the Centre for Personalised Medicine. That centre, the Centre for Personalised Medicine, is a joint initiative, a new initiative in Oxford, and something of a novel paradigm in being a collaboration between uh, part of the university on the one hand, the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics, and part of the collegiate side of the university, St Anne's College, on the other. Within the Wellcome Trust Centre, we're passionate about the potential impact of our science, and in particular of genomics, on clinical medicine, and about facilitating the translation of those discoveries into the clinic. We're very grateful to our partners, St Anne's College, and in particular, Tim Gardam, its uh, principal, who jointly chairs the steering committee of the Centre for Personalised Medicine with me, and his colleagues, firstly for their vision in wanting to align activity within the college to research focus within the university, and secondly because as partners they fill a very natural role in bringing a very strong interdisciplinary academic presence in the way Oxford colleges do, and also critically their key role in the education of students. The Centre for Personalised Medicine is, ra is rather young, it's in its early stages, it's only about five months old. And within the centre we see a number of key opportunities and key foci. And one of those critically we think is in education and outreach to a number of different constituencies in making those groups aware of the potential, the opportunities and possibly some of the challenges involved in delivering the promise of personalised medicine. So part of that's the medical students within Oxford, more broadly the student community. Beyond that, uh, healthcare professionals locally and perhaps nationally, and absolutely critical members of the public in, in making them aware of the potential changes, the excitement of the science, and the potential changes that advances in genomics in particular will bring to clinical medicine. The other thing the centre hopes to do in its early days is to act as a forum for bringing together people within Oxford who have interests in personalised medicine. Whether they be basic scientists, clinical scientists or social scientists, there's a real opportunity and it's something that Oxford traditionally does very well in bringing together uh, workers across disciplines to focus on particular areas and we think this is one which is ripe for doing that. We thought rather hard within the centre about who'd be the right kind of person to give our inaugural lecture, as it were, someone who would be both inspirational and informative, and we're absolutely delighted when Patrick Valance accepted our invitation. Patrick's uh, the president for pharmaceuticals R&D within GlaxoSmithKline. Before joining GSK in 2006, he had a very distinguished and very successful academic career as a clinical academic, with his work spanning clinical medicine, internal medicine, cardiovascular medicine, and clinical pharmacology. Amongst many other leadership roles, he led the Division of Medicine at University College London and served as Registrar for the Academy of Medical Sciences. When Patrick moved to GSK, he transformed their drug discovery program. He was extremely successful and promoted internally to the stage where he's now a central member of the company's core senior leadership team. I look to a handful of people who I see as real thought leaders in the field of personalised medicine, the promise of personalised medicine, and critically, the practicalities of per personalised medicine, and Patrick's absolutely one of those. It's my great pleasure to welcome him to give tonight's lecture, Making Medicines for Individuals and Populations. Patrick, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, I must say, I think the centre is an outstandingly good idea, um, particularly because of its interdisciplinary nature. I think the idea of bringing in uh, laws, ethics, other parts of the university is incredibly important in this complex area. The other thing I should say is that um, when you're about to give a lecture, there are a few things you don't want to hear, and I think I heard both of them this afternoon when I arrived. One of them was I heard somebody in the crew doing the filming and stuff saying, the lecturer looks flat and white. <laughs> the second thing I heard was, Dennis Lowe gave the most outstanding lecture this afternoon. 
sort of lecture you'd really like to go to. So there we are. That was, that was the warm-up for this. <laughs> what I want to do is to talk a little bit about uh, personalised medicines, but I really want to talk at it from the angle of trying to make a medicine. What it is you need to think about when trying to make something which is going to be given to patients across the world. And um, to start off with, I thought I'd give a little bit of background to the pharmaceutical industry and some of the problems that have been plaguing the industry over the past 20 or more years as a way to try and understand why there's a need for change and what that change looks like. So this is definitely, by the way, not a law in the sense that actually things got better in the last couple of years, and I believe things are getting better for a number of reasons. But it's a pretty sobering graph nonetheless <laughs> What it says is the number of drugs per billion dollars against time, and you can see it's not the sort of graph that most people who deal in money like to see. It is a massively expensive business, it's got progressively more expensive, and the productivity has decreased, and the length of time between starting and finishing has increased. So there's been a productivity problem, which is bizarre in a way, at a time when most of us feel that the advances in understanding human biology have been very great. And I think it's that switch between applying those advances to making medicines, which we're just on the cusp of now, and I think that's why this is such an important time to be talking about this topic. And in fact, in the last year, last 12 months, we got six new medicines approved at GSK, which is more interestingly than in the entire history of the company since it was GSK as GSK, as big new medicine. So you can sort of see there's a turnaround in terms of how things are happening, but it's dependent upon a number of key factors, and I believe this is changing. The environment, though, is very different. I want to say a few things which um, are relevant to thinking about this area. First, the blockbuster model is unsustainable. What do I mean by that? I don't mean it's not possible to make a drug that makes lots of money. It clearly is possible to make a medicine that can be hugely successful and can actually be used in many, many millions of patients. However, what is unsustainable is a model that says, we happen to have a drug in disease area X, which is very successful. Please, R&D, go and make another one and make it equally successful. It doesn't work like that. It's a very volatile model. It's exactly why you see big troughs and peaks in terms of uh, productivity, in terms of profitability of the organisations. You have to make medicines where it's possible to make medicines and you have to make enough of them because you don't know which one is going to become a very big medicine when you start. The second thing is that we're now in an environment where actually who gets to prescribe a medicine is determined by payers. So in the uh, UK that's uh, really nice and then the NHS, and in the US system, it's uh, managed healthcare organisations and others. There is a reimbursement hurdle that actually demands a number of things. And in fact, what the payers have done is they've turned the definition of innovation away from innovation is what we say to innovation is what they say. And they're very focused, in my mind, rightly, on things like what is the true patient benefit that I can measure, why should I pay for that and how does that impact my healthcare system? But of course, there's also huge pressure to say, what does that mean for me as an individual? And that's an important part of this. There are also higher risks to the whole process post-launch. So when you launch a medicine, increasingly the regulators are asking for large safety and other studies after the launch of a medicine, further increasing the cost and complexity of the business. It takes longer, patent life is fixed, if it takes longer to get to the end stage, you've got a reduced amount of time in which to have exclusivity on your medicine, and that's been progressively shrinking. Pricing of medicines progressively reflects both innovation and uh, the um, differentiation that you can have of your medicine, how different truly is it from what goes before. And in fact, there are some slightly strange perverse incentives where you're more likely to be able to get an expensive medicine reimbursed if the existing medicine's expensive than if the existing medicine is not expensive. And that's an interesting thing in terms of where innovation is actually stimulated. And of course, in the last few years, there have been some pretty good, uh, pretty big macroeconomic pressure. So that's some of the background. So why is that relevant to personalized medicines? Number one, what, does pe what do people really look for when they're approving a medicine or when they're choosing to pay for it? They're looking for a maximized benefit and a minimized risk. 
And that is difficult to achieve at a population level. It's easier to achieve as you get to smaller populations and more precision in terms of what you're trying to do. They're looking for a risk which they can understand and don't have to have massive population studies after approval. We're looking for that to happen quickly so that we can get our medicine through, as indeed patients are and prescribers are. And we're looking to do it in a way that allows the price to be such that it's absorbable in a healthcare system that hasn't got an infinitely elastic budget. So that's why this topic is important. And I want to give a little bit of background to what we mean, what I think of as personalised medicine. So in some ways, it's blindingly obvious. It's the right medicine given to the right patient at the right dose. Nothing very startling about that. I want to say a word about dose, though, because it's often forgotten. You look at the history of medicines, the number of medicines that didn't make it because somebody got the wrong dose is big. So a very sort of seemingly trivial point. The number of medicines that get withdrawn from the market because the dose was slightly wrong is big. That's an important thing. I don't actually know how we deal with that in terms of some of the things I'm going to talk about later. It may be something to come back with. But this idea, the right medicine to the right patient at the right dose, is actually pretty normal in medicine. Nothing new about that at all. So in many ways, personalised medicine is not new. It's actually been the drive from the beginning. Medicine's, medicine is all about trying to get greater precision. You know, we don't think of diseases as diseases of the motor system, blemishes, and so on. They are actually more categorised, and they've been categorised increasingly over many years. So the notion of either disease stratification, greater personalisation, is embedded in medicine. The stethoscope was fundamentally important in understanding how diseases came together and how one could think of them in a consistent way. So precision of diagnosis is not something new. Precision of medicines is not new. I'm rereading Jude the Obscure at the moment. I'm struck by a passage. Physician Filbert is the sole proprietor of those magical pills that infallibly cure all ailments of the alimentary system, shortness of breath and asthma. These were the sorts of claims that went on. This is a particularly lovely one. It's good for everything. Um, it's uh, good for man and beast, so it's both human health and animal health. It gives immediate relief, which is great. Um, it's the strongest and best for, uh, thing known for pain and also laziness, which is actually incredibly helpful. You can see things, things have become more precise. And it's worth, you know, we laugh at this, and it's worth remembering that actually if you go back and look at some of the things uh, of the claims of Henry Welcome, they were quite interesting. And, uh, and of course, that led to the Wellcome uh, um, Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. So these things are about increasing precision. And when you look at diseases, it's pretty clear that things are being lumped, as we understand more about the descriptor of a disease, but they're also being split increasingly. And I think very few people now think of breast cancer as a single disease. They think of it as a series of uh, molecularly defined entities. And of course, there's an increased uh, pressure, actually, to now think about histology agnostic uh, clinical trials, about thinking about how you look at tumours as um, by their molecular characterization rather than by their anatomical characterization. So this is real, it's here, it's now, and it's what's happening to diseases. So let me now go back to the industry and tell you a little bit about how we think about making medicines. So this, if you like, is both the process and to some extent the problem. If you start thinking, how do, what do I, how, where do I want to make a medicine? What do I want to make the medicine against? That's the first step, and at any time in GSK, we have hundreds of projects going on trying to explore where to start to make the medicine. There are four key decisions that we have to make as we go through, and I'll come back to that, but if you follow this to the right-hand side, you start, with uh, start on the left with thousands of compounds, you end on the right with one compound. The whole process takes something in excess of 10 years. It costs something in excess of $1 billion, that includes, of course, the ones that don't make it. So the total cost of the process is large. The um, timelines are long. Let me maybe ca caricature two different types of approach. So I start deciding I want to make a medicine, and I start deciding I want to make a medicine against depression. I don't want to make a medicine against one of the convincing existing targets or existing 
pathways because I believe it'll be the same as everything else. Very often, the process in a disease like depression at the moment is not much more robust than it's expressed in the right part of the brain, the target you're going after. So you start at a position of very poor knowledge of where to make your medicine. You then go into an animal model, and you can guarantee that a depressed animal is not a good measure of whether your drug is going to work in a human, but that's what's done. By now you've got your molecule, you'll take it into the clinic. You will test safety, you will test pharmacokinetics, you will still not know whether this medicine works. You will then do a small phase two study to try and understand whether it does have an impact on depression and you're very likely to end up with a rather random result which could be positive or it could be negative. If it's positive you're very pleased and you carry on, if it's negative you might drop it. You then do a phase three study, so you still don't know whether your medicine works. You haven't really got any firm clues whether it works. You do your phase three study. In phase three studies, you often use a positive control of an existing antidepressant. When you do that, those drugs fail 50% of the time. They don't differentiate from placebo. So in depression, let's say you were right at the beginning. If you get to the end of the process, even if you were right, 50% of the time, your phase three trial will fail. That is a massively high risk enterprise for drug discovery and development. It's a big problem in terms of thinking how we can tackle what is a very important disease. At the other end of the spectrum, take something like a cancer with a known mutation as a driver of that cancer. You know what the cause is, or you know what a driver is. You know exactly which patients to get, you know how to measure the output, you're going to know very quickly where you are in that paradigm. That's why pipelines across the world are full up with anti-cancer drugs at the moment and not antidepressant drugs. It's to do with the precision in which you can start and understand whether you've got an effect. So, what I want to do, and I'm very nervous about talking about genetics to this audience, but I do want to talk about genetics and personalised medicines, and I do want to give some glimpses into some of the things that I think could be important. And I want to talk about it in terms of target support, and then I want to talk about it in terms of patient stratification and differentiated medicines. So there's a, an outline of, of, of some advances in cancer. You can see, first of all, the timelines between deciding what to do or deciding that there is a target and doing something are actually changing. They're going in the reverse direction to what I talked about earlier on. There's now a very rapid process from understanding truly what might be a driver in cancer and getting to some sort of medicine. And you can see this across industry. You've got the early, um, really groundbreaking examples of things like Gleevec and, and Herceptin, and you can come down and you can see other examples. A few things to notice. One, the timelines. Two, of course, this isn't largely dealing with um, uh, mutations in the host, as it were. This is cancer cell changes. This is different in terms of its uh, uh, relationship to common genetics. It's also different in terms of the need for diagnostics. You've got a sort of binary effect in some of these. Some of these won't work in some patients whose tumours don't have these changes. So this is a very much more precise end of the spectrum. It requires a diagnostic to be developed very often in conjunction with the medicine. That in its, is in itself a problem that I think needs to be addressed. I don't think that we can have a system that continues to demand a new diagnostic for every medicine that comes along, especially as some of the technologies are actually the same for all of them. But this is cancer. So cancer is definitely in the era of personalised medicine, but of course the personalisation, if you like, is at the tumour level usually, not really at the person level in the way we often think about it. So are there other examples where you end up with almost a binary, yes it works, no it doesn't, and something that's as certain, if you like, as some of these. Well, you do when you go to rare diseases. If you go to monogenic diseases, you have now a germline change that actually has many of the same characteristics. So here's an example of uh, Blau syndrome. And um, I'm not going to sort of do the 
medical school lecture thing and asked John Bell as the, uh, as the Regis professor to tell me all about Blau syndrome. But Blau syndrome is, is incredibly rare. And uh, it's just an example. It's a disease caused by a, um, an activating mutation in, in, the, in a pattern recognition receptor called NOD2. And it causes um, dermatitis, synovitis, uveitis, and actually they get bowel problems as well. Turns out that um, NOD2 is an activator of a kinase called RIP2 kinase, and therefore is a druggable target. Very, very rare disease, but druggable. Now, you might expect this to be a binary thing. You've either got this mutation or you haven't, and, and you would therefore end up with a drug that can be used only in a very few people. And that may be the case in many rare diseases, but in some, of course, it's not the case. And it turns out that you can see changes in RIP2 kinase in other people. So I'm not going to go into details here, but these are the patients with Blau syndrome or the healthy controls. You can detect activated RIP2 kinase in these patients. And then if you go to common disease and ask, do you ever see situations where you see activation of RIP2 kinase? You do. So you can build from the rare disease back into common disease. And therefore, you can use the rare disease as a way of understanding human target validation back into common disease. Now, we don't know whether this is going to work in common disease, but I would rather start with this sort of evidence than start with some of the evidence that we often start with in the industry. This tells me that this is causal, at least in some types of human disease. So sometimes with rare diseases, you may end up with a binary. It only works in that disease and not. Sometimes you can use it as a way to think about common disease as well. Are there situations in which the rare disease is only going to be treated and nothing else? And does that give you any insights into how to think about personalised medicine? Well, here's another example, and this is a, a medicine that we've got in development in conjunction with um, a group in Italy, and there are others doing this sort of thing as well. So this is um, a gene therapy for an immunodeficiency syndrome called ADA-SCID, a fatal condition in children. And uh, we're going for um, a gene therapy approach here. In this particular one, with a retroviral approach, but in others, we're going with a lentiviral approach of actually doing gene replacement in the cells and reinserting them into the children. And um, so far, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine not long ago, there's a very dramatic effect on the, on the um, circulating immune cells in these, in these children. It looks really quite startling in terms of what could be possible. So it's still in... Uh, um, phase three, so we don't know for sure, but this looks like a, an extraordinary way to approach a very difficult disease to treat. Now, why is that important for uh, a big pharmaceutical company? It's important because, A, it's the right thing to do in terms of trying to uh, get treatments to these sorts of conditions, but B, it is the place where you can understand gene therapy. You can't understand gene therapy in common disease, and in fact, it's been very difficult. If you go back 25 years, actually many of the, the, much of the hype around gene therapy actually failed because people went into much too common diseases, didn't really understand how to do it. And so sometimes the rare disease may only give you a treatment for that disease, but give you a technology insight into how you treat something more common. So that's target support. It can be somatic changes, if you like, in cancer cells. It can be monogenic disease. And that can give you insight into how you think about diagnostics. So you can imagine in the RIP2 kinase field, you might think about measuring some downstream effect of RIP2 kinase activation. You can imagine how you might select patients on the basis of that. Or it may be that very individualized treatments like the gene therapy give you some insight into technology. What about the notion of common variation and disease? And I'm going to show you some unpublished data from groups in GSK, uh, from John Whitaker's group in particular, where we've been trying to ask that question about common genetic variation and how one might think about that in terms of um, target uh, discovery. So this is um, an analysis of drugs in either approved, phase three, phase two, so clinical trials, phase one, very early healthy volunteer trials, or preclinical. And it's simply asking the question, is there any genetic association 
known for the drug target. And the first thing to say is that the percentage of drugs with any known association is low. You'll see it's about 5% in the approved drugs. But what you'll also see is the percentage is much lower as you go back earlier in the pipeline. Now, what is that about? What it actually tells you is that we think, now there may be other interpretations, but I think this is what, what this tells you, is that if you start with any degree of genetic validation, so this is GWAS and other things, you are more likely to make it to the end. So this is a cross-sectional snapshot, but actually, given that it's GWAS, it shouldn't matter, because it can't be about time of looking into something. This tells you, I think, that you have a survival benefit as a medicine from the beginning of the process to approval if you've got any degree of genetic validation. That's quite an important observation that I think has profound implications. Let's say that's partially true. Let's say it's only half true. The success rate from target through to approved medicine is something like 3%. If you can make it 6%, you completely change the economics of the whole industry and you completely change the outlook for patients. So this potentially is very important. We looked at it another way, we, not, absolutely not me, John Whitaker and his team, and this is now asking, it's a much smaller data set, this is just GSK data, and it's asking the question of drugs in phase two and three that either made it to the end, success, or somehow dropped out because of lack of efficacy, failure, what was the evidence of any degree of genetic association? So the relative similarities. So the group at the bottom, the, the genetic association was more similar to the d disease indication and, and less at the top. And what you can see is that even in that small data set, your odds ratio of being successful, i.e. the drug making it is higher if there's a degree of genetic association, any degree. So this was really surprising. These are not close associations. It just tells you that some degree of association seems to predict success. And roughly, in phase three, we see a nine times increase in success, and roughly from the beginning of the process, target selection to the end, roughly a twofold increase in success. So that tells us that there's something here that could be important in terms of understanding targets. It's not uniform across disease states, so if you look and you ask the question uh, about different disease states and drugs, you see the, actually there's some ev more evidence at the top end of this curve that there's a genetic association for the drug and less down the bottom when we're down in areas like drugs affecting behavioural disorders. Okay, and I want to move and talk a little bit about patient stratification and differentiated medicines. And I want to focus not on the diagnostics, which I've talked a little bit about, but I want to talk about the other side of medicines, which is things like, are they absorbed? Do they get distributed in the body? Uh, do they have an unwanted effect? Is there a safety issue that we need to worry about? So so-called ADME, that's the distribution, metabolism, excretion, safety, and to a little extent about efficacy, pharmacogenetics. If you look at the um, effect size of a common genetic vari variation with any common disease, that's all the grayed out bits there. So what you can see is most of the effect sizes of common genetic variations are very small. If you ask the question, what is the effect size of most of the association with drug issues, so that's safety issues, liver changes, um, differences in dosing because you've got a very, you can see the effect size is big. So G, common genetic variation that changes drug effects seems to be big, or at least those are the ones we've found, and you can see they're off to the right. And a lot of those, of course, turn out to be HLA. And I want to give you one example, and the example, I think, has an interesting uh, message in terms of how you use this sort of information in terms of clinical practice. So we're looking at drug-induced unwanted effects. So we have a drug um, called lapatinib or Tycurb, <coughs> which is um, a, a drug for cancer. It's a dual kinase inhibitor, and we found it had a liver signal. It had an adverse effect. Liver enzymes increased, 
And uh, it wasn't a common thing, it was relatively unusual, but we saw it and we wanted to understand it and we looked at um, um, some genetics to try and understand it. And what we found was an HLA type was very associated with um, this adverse effect. So you can see here um, that uh, this is the cumulative frequency of an increase in liver enzymes and you've either got carriers or you've got um, wild type and you can see if you're a carrier you have a really big apparent increase in your risk of getting a liver, liver enzyme increase with this drug and if you're on placebo the curves are overlapping as you would expect. So this isn't some general marker of liver disease, this seems to be a drug specific <coughs> effect. If you look at the data, <clears throat> So in just over a thousand patients, you can see um, there were this number of cases of raised liver enzymes. So these are not serious, but they are elevated and they could be markers of a serious increase in, 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 in liver problems. And, and you can see here that there's definitely a difference and that the carriers has an odds ratio of about 14. So this is a big effect. When you actually look at this and ask the question, well, what do you do with that information in terms of clinical practice? I can tell you exactly what the regulators did. They said, thank you very much, we're not interested. Because it's not precise enough to know who you should and shouldn't give this drug to. And actually, in this case, the answer was monitor liver function tests in everyone if they start going up, stop the drug. Which is actually very sensible advice, but it tells you the difficulty, even when you've got a big odds ratio of understanding how to translate that into a clinical decision as to who you should or shouldn't give this medicine to. And I think this is a challenge for unwanted effects, it's a challenge even more so for efficacy signals, because it's not going to be binary in most of these conditions as it was in the cancer example, as it can be in rare diseases. It's going to be a population-based effect, and in fact, very often the payers and regulators will err on the side of wanting the population as a whole to get the drug rather than try and segment on something which is imprecise in the way it predicts the outcome. I've talked about genetics. I just want to remind us that the personalised medicine agenda is not all about genetics and in many cases it's about other things. In fact, I've just talked about one which is measuring liver function tests. I'll give you an example now of something which seems very simple, and actually it came from Ian Pavord, who's now here. This is when Ian was in, 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 in Leicester. This was a study with um, uh, a drug of ours, which is an anti-IL-5 antibody um, for treatment of um, uh, severe asthma exacerbations. And here we're looking at the asthma exacerbations. It doesn't matter, but that's the placebo in blue, and then there's three doses of drug below. The key thing about this is the reason this study worked and showed how this drug could be used in practice was about measuring eosinophils in sputum or blood. So absolutely able to distinguish, in this case, a responder population, not absolute, same issues as I've just discussed, but now we're talking about a relatively simple test in terms of a blood test of eosinophil number. So we just need to remember that as we go down this phenotyping route of understanding how to, how to give medicines differently, there's going to be a range of techniques, some of which are going to be simple, some of which are going to be more complex, and some of which may actually change with time. And that leads me to this uh, point here, which is that we've talked about right medicine, right patient, right dose. Right time, I think, is going to be a very interesting challenge in this whole field. What do I mean by this? I'm not talking about chronobiology. I'm talking about whether you can work out when somebody needs the medicine in order to achieve the effect you want. This, I think, is going to be a very big challenge. It already is in some ways in cancer treatments as we move to this becoming a chronic disease. How do you know when to treat and how do you know that you need to treat with the same drug? Let's say there's a particular mutation or indeed has something changed. I think as we think about continuous sensors, and I think this is not round the corner, but it's not far off as one thinks about being able to monitor these things. You're going to have to think differently about the timing of intervention. I'll give you another example. We treat cardiovascular risk as though it's static. In other words, you have a risk of X percent over the next 10 years of having a cardiovascular event. Well, the truth is, you have a cardiovascular event one day, you don't have it 
at a certain percentage of risk every day. And it's very clear that actually your risk isn't static, it goes up and down. Is it possible that you can start to understand when your personal risk is going up and when you should start taking more treatment? I can tell you the answer to that at the moment is we don't know how to do that. But there are people, and particularly companies, I think I was talking to John Bell earlier on the west coast of the US, absolutely thinking about how to get multiple monitoring of multiple uh, parameters in real time and understand when you're getting spikes of risk. I think these things are happening. I don't know how they'll play out, but you can imagine that adds another complexity to the notion of what we mean by personalized medicine and when in fact you maximize your benefit compared to your risk. So let me come back to this. There are four key decisions when we make a medicine. One, which target do we work on? What do we actually start working on? That is probably the key decision because you may end up working on it for 15 years. That decision, I think, is dramatically informed by patient phenotype, by patient stratification, by disease stratification, and increasingly, I think, by genetics, which personally I think is going to be now very, very important in that decision making within GSK and I'm sure in other companies as well. The second key decision is which molecule am I going to make against that target? Either an antibody or a small molecule or an antisense or a gene therapy, whatever it is. That is predominantly about the hardware of the medicine, if you like. That's the second key decision, because once you've made that molecule, that's the molecule that's got all the promise and all the risks and everything else locked into that molecule at that moment. The third key decision is how do I understand, with the medicine I have, that I'm doing something important physiologically in the body that might improve a disease. This is the bit of experimental medicine that I think nobody is very good at. I think it's absolutely where some of these things of experimental medicine need to be applied, uh, where, where personalized medicines become applied in terms of patient stratification and measurement of very specific things which can tell you about the actions of your medicine. The fourth key decision is how do you exemplify the medicine in large populations to um, payers and regulators and there again stratification is going to be important but actually it's not going to be uniformly important across all disease areas it's going to be selectively important in some the fifth decision which I've alluded to and I'm not going to go back over again is dose throughout all this you get the dose wrong you screw up and dose differences may well be quite individual and at the moment we have no real way of understanding how to um, individualized dosing and in fact everything plays against individualizing dosing in terms of the processes we have for regulation and other things at the moment but those four decisions are the key ones I do believe the things that I think you're going to be talking about in this center things that are important in terms of the way we're understanding disease biology are critical in, in at least three of those stages and are going to be transformational in some areas more than others but particularly I think around target identification and its link through to experimental medicine. You don't do this alone and I think that also plays to the changing model of the pharmaceutical industry in terms of how you need to be outward looking whether it's with multiple other companies whether it's with specialist companies that understand this or whether it's with academia and I will express a prejudice here which I feel pretty strongly about which is that when it comes to the area of target identification, I think this is about open innovation. I do not think this is about proprietary ownership by companies. And the reason I say that is that I think everyone needs to understand the basis on which you can make a drug. The proprietary bit is the invention you make against that. And I think that is the way this will go. I think that much of this will become much more open. And I think if we do that, we'll get to a state where it's possible to make decisions on the basis of a, a knowledge base which is open for everyone to access and then you make your choice because it's not as though that decision's made for you, it's still a very big judgment call as to what you go with. So I think open innovation in this area is important and I think we'll see more of it and I do think that the sorts of things that are now happening are going to make a massive difference in not only where we start but how we progress medicines. I haven't 
talk to how you ultimately implement that in the clinic. I think you can do it in cancer. I think you can do it in rare diseases. I think you can do it in some other areas. I think it's very difficult in many of the common variants and common changes that we see across uh, uh, measurements to know how you make sure that you're not excluding patients who benefit or indeed including patients who in fact should be excluded. And that's the challenge, I think, which faces us both at an individual level and at a societal level. Thank you very much for your attention.